Hey. Hi there, friends. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this uh, session here. Uh, today we have something really, really interesting for you. It's the fifth part uh, in a series about microservices. We will talk about feature flags, cloud native uh, applications in ASP.NET Core and microservices. Here is the uh, module in question. There's a link, there's also a QR code that you can scan. My name is Chris Noring. I'm the senior cloud advocate with Microsoft. And with me, I got Swami. Swami, can you tell our audience about yourself? Of course. Hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the times and wherever you are from. Thank you so much for joining us on this Learn Live session. So my name is Swami. I work as a cloud solution architect at MERS, working on building cloud native applications using Azure and Kubernetes, etc. And I'm also Microsoft MVP under developer technologies. And I'm from India, Bangalore. And yeah, my interests are mostly around .NET, Azure, Kubernetes, DevOps, and things like that. So apart from work, I also do a bit of photography and then road trips. Of course, not now, pre-COVID era it was. Road trips and, and also blogging and you know doing a bit of home automation. So what do you do, Chris, apart from the work? What do I do uh, apart from the work? Yeah, I'm uh, somewhat of a painter. I'm, I'm more in, uh, in those kind of sports. Um, speaking of sports, I, I used to do table tennis many years ago, but uh, wow. that's past since, right? Uh, <laughs> let's dive into yeah. this session, shall we? Yeah, of course. We have our uh, moderator with us, Iris Klasson, and uh, I believe uh, Iris is based in Sweden, and I'm from Sweden as well, so go Sweden, am I right? <laughs> um, yeah, so say hi to I Iris, everyone, and I believe she will feature in a future series, a future part in this series, so definitely check that out. Uh, right, so shall we put some focus on the learn module in question? So this learn module is part of a path. It lives on aka.ms slash learn. Learn is the big platform right now with, uh, I think, close to 3,000 different modules that you can upskill for free. This one is called Implement Feature Flags in a Cloud-Native ASP.NET Core Microservices App. It can be found on this link. And again, this QR code is something that you can scan and you will be taken to the site instead. Uh, Learn is completely interactive. It has sandboxes. You don't need to spend your own credits. However, this module is somewhat of an exception because you will use your actual subscription to use this. Um, right. Learning objectives. What are we actually learning today? Well, there are three different things, three things that we will learn today. The first one is that we will learn about ASP.NET Core and configuration, uh, and as well how, how to add those configurations uh, in Kubernetes. Uh, so yeah, Kubernetes is a thing we're going to use. We're going to use a managed version of it called AKS or Azure Kubernetes Service. Swami will tell you all about that. Uh, one other thing that we're going to do also is to add feature toggling. And one of the requirements with this feature toggling is that it's real time, uh, meaning that we will be able to create a flag and also set that flag into false or true in real time. And you will see that result happening. And uh, we will use something called the feature management library, which is a NuGet package that you can add to your project as well. Now, lastly, what we will do also is to implement a centralized Azure uh, app configuration store. Configuration is one thing, right? They can live locally, but it can also live as a global uh, Azure service that you can access from anywhere. And there are definitely pros for doing so that we will also cover. Yeah. Is it clear, Swami? Is that what we're covering? Any, any thoughts so far? Yeah, I think you are bang on. Yeah, ah, we can fantastic. continue. Yeah. Okay, then let's try to set the context. Where are we? Well, mm -hmm. we are uh, at the storefront of something, a company called eShop on containers. They are selling a bunch of things. They're selling cups, they're selling hoodies, t-shirts and everything, of course, with the .NET logo on. I, I don't think I have one of these .NET hoods. Do you have one from me? I have a t-shirt. Yeah, not a hoodie though. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's nice. cool. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell our audience about what it looks like? <laughs> it's with a .NET bot in the middle, and then just say, yeah, your platform to do anything, right? That's, that's exactly what .NET is for, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. I need to get myself one of these. Maybe I can use this storefront even, right? We'll order in this session now for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. 
So uh, there's an exercise, or there are several exercises we're going to do today, three of them. Uh, in the first exercise, we will set up our, our environment. We will make sure to deploy our application so it's running on Azure Kubernetes Service, or AKS. And in the exercise after that, uh, Swami, can you take us through what we're going to do high level? Yeah, yeah, sure, Chris. Yeah, so first thing is, yeah, let's do an environment setup, right? Where we are going to deploy this entire application. So the entire source code is present in GitHub. So there are also scripts available to, uh, to you know, to run the script, to set up the environment as if so you don't have to do anything manually. So just run the script and then we should be able to get this application up and running, right? So it takes about 10 minutes or so to provision a new AKS cluster, which, which is the Azure Kubernetes Service cluster, and then an ACR, which is the Azure Container Registry. And then we would we would and then we can start modifying code and then we can start redeploying application into that particular cluster, right? So in the interest of time, we kind of uh, ran those scripts. The scripts are available in the learn module, and uh, I just ran the scripts and then the application is set up and up and running, right? So what are the things this script does, right? It basically installs the .NET SDK which is needed to run this particular application, and then it also builds the uh, basically builds the entire code. First, it of course clones the code from the eShop containers GitHub repository, and then it also builds it, builds the image for each of these microservices. And like I said, it provisions AKS clusters, ACR resources, and then launches the cloud shell where we can also explore the code. Plus, we can also start making further code changes or command or the command changes to you know build and redeploy the applications. Yeah. All right. Sounds sounds really good. Okay, so we have scripts. They're gonna help you on your way. It's just so you yeah. don't have to do all of these steps manually. As part of the scripts, there will be commands in there. I will show you these scripts as well. Uh, without yeah. further ado, I'm going to go in inside of the learn module itself. Yeah. One second. There we go. So there's an actual physical learn module that I'm hopefully showing mm -hmm. you right now. Uh, right. I, I just wanted to quickly show you the series. If you haven't seen that, if you haven't been part of this, this is a series that have, we are in part five. This is the learning path in question, create microservices with .NET and ASP.NET Core. If you were here from part one, it would say build your first microservice with .NET. The second part would be how you would deploy a .NET microservice to Kubernetes and so on. So you can see how your knowledge is uh, quickly being built up gradually. Mm -hmm. Uh, to add resiliency and a lot of other nice things. Feature flags is the one we are doing today. This is part five. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Can you please zoom in a little bit? Uh, the the yes, screen is of bit, course. a little smaller to read. That, Polly, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. So here you can see the uh, module in question. You see that it has an introduction unit, an exercise unit. So if you're with us right now, we are going to dive into this step, the setting up yeah. of the environment. Now, uh, the steps we're going to take here is to open up our Azure Cloud Shell. Uh, Cloud Shell is a thing that we can use to interact with our various resources. We could also be using our command line. And there is a deployment script that I thought we'd uh, show really quickly. So uh, the idea from our side when we teach you this exercise is that you are inside uh, Cloud Shell, you're running various commands. However, were you to do this for real, you would probably do this slightly differently, but this is just for the narration of the story and make sure it flows really well. Now, there is this script that you are running. And once you run that script, what will happen on your machine, I want to uh, state that, is that it will install a required version of .NET SDK. It will also clone the code, which is a bunch of microservices. Um, it will provision an AKS instance, an Azure Kubernetes instance, an Azure Container Registry, and to make sure that you can push your uh, Docker images to it. Uh, it will also launch the Cloud Shell Editor to view the code. Uh, let's just uh, follow this uh, rabbit here and, and see where this URL leads. So were I to go there, uh, this is what I would see. Hopefully, this font size is good. Uh, this is the script. And uh, yeah, so this script will take you through all these various uh, places where it's cloning uh, the code repo and it's deploying all of those code resources. You can see that the script leads to a script in turn. That's funny, right? Recursion. Uh, what I wanted to show you with the uh, detailed script is that it does a lot of heavy lifting for you. And that heavy lifting mm -hmm. is to provision databases, um, you know, like Mongo, Postgres, uh, Azure SQL. We're using everything in our tool toolbox today. App Insights, App Service, Key Vault uh, for our secrets, right? 
app service plan and so on. So there's a lot of nice functions here. So you don't have to worry about doing all of these things manually. It's being handled for you. Now, back to the uh, exercise itself. So imagine that you are running this command. As Swami was saying earlier, if I were to run this command, it would take you 10 minutes. I don't want you to stare at the screen for 10 minutes. So Swami has already run this command in the background. Uh, but I wanted to show you quickly what you're getting when you're running this command. And then I'm going to leave over to Swami. Now, if I were to run this command, I have waited 10 minutes. It's 10 minutes in the future. You're with me, right? It's time travel. 10 minutes in the future. This is what we're looking at. We're looking at client apps, the web spa. This is our storefront. This is what you're physically going to see. So that's an Angular application uh, written in TypeScript. Uh, there will also be an AKS cluster provision for you and it will have gateways uh, inside of there. There's an API gateway and an HTTP aggregator. And there's also the microservices that you might care about uh, a little extra about if you're an application developer. What you're getting is identity, the thing that hands off. You are getting the catalog, which contains all the products, the t-shirts that Swami is going to buy me, right, Swami? And the yeah. ordering microservice, the payment microservice, the basket microservice, and lastly, the point of interest for today, the coupon microservice. So we have set up the database. We have set up part of the service, but we haven't uh, put it to use yet. So mm -hmm. currently, were you to deploy this application, the coupon service would just work. And that's part of our requirement is to take that thing and make sure it's feature toggle rather than being on all the time. Now, Swami, can you show everyone your cloud shell and what actually happened when you deploy this? Yeah, definitely. Right. So I've done the deployment already. So once the script is complete, right, it will open up the code window where you can see the entire um, application code base here, right? So this is the GitHub repository, which is cloned here into this particular cloud shell. When you say cloud shell, it's in the storage account, right? So now under the source is where you have all these different um, you know, components of this particular application. So API gateways, if you can relate it to the picture, what uh, Chris showed, this is where the API gateway components reside. And the building blocks is where we have all the event hub and the web host and things like that. And under services is where we are going to have all these different microservices hosted, basket, catalog, coupon, identity, ordering, payment, etc. Right. And the web, we have two things. One is the web SP and the web status. So SP is nothing but the single page application. Like Chris mentioned, that's the uh, Razor View plus Angular based application. So we're going to look at uh, how what are the different pieces in it, and then we'll start modifying the codes in a short while. Right. I'm just trying to give a high level walkthrough so that you feel comfortable when you start making code changes. Right. So these are the source code, what we would deal with. So primarily we would uh, deal with the OBSP client side of it. And also since, like I said, since it's a Razor view based application, you can also see the program CS, startup CS, et cetera. And that's where we would see how we can play around with the different configuration settings, right? And to deploy this entire source code, we have these uh, Kubernetes scripts available. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes, I highly encourage you to uh, go through, I think it's session number two or session number three in this particular series, where we have an entire learn model around how you can start from scratch and then deploy your you know, microservice into Kubernetes ecosystem, right? And this is a little, uh, it's, it's, it's gone to the next step, basically where we're using Helm. So Helm is nothing but a package manager for Kubernetes. You can think of like a chocolatey or Winget or, or you know, on a brew on a Mac and Macintosh. Right? It's something similar to that. If you want to package some of your Kubernetes manifest together, and then if you want to deploy it in a, in a single shot, then you can use Helm at a very high level, right? So this also use Helm charts. So as we can see, Let's see if you want to deploy a web SPA, you will have something called chart.yaml, which says the chart name is SPA, and you will specify all the Kubernetes manifests, right? So just for everyone to be on the same page. So these are the bad minimum Kubernetes manifests we would need. Like deployment YAML is where we specify what is the deployment we are doing and how many instances of our application to be running and what containers and what is the image and things like that, right? That's what would go in here. And to expose this deployment to anyone else within the cluster or even outside the cluster, you would use a service.yaml. That's what we have created here. And then there's also something called ingress. That is what is something which will expose the entire thing to external to the Kubernetes cluster itself, right? So the call will come to the ingress and then to the service. And then from service, it will go down to the pods which are running inside that, right? That's how the entire thing is. And I'm going to leave this config map for a while because we'll touch upon it when we, when we talk about what is Kubernetes config map. And then maybe I'll explain more on that part, All right? Yeah, and that's about it. And okay. primarily, yeah, we will have all the other scripts as well to build the image and everything. So uh, almost everything is scripted here. You just need to understand the right command. And then, you know, we can just go through it. We'll also go through that as part of our next uh, session, next uh, sequence of actions, right? Yeah. Over to you, Chris. All right. 
Okay, then back to me. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you as part of the exercise is a cleanup command. I just want to put an emphasis. You are using your own Azure credits as you go through this exercise. So make sure that if uh, to make sure that you're not being billed uh, more than we want you to be billed, right? For the sake of this exercise, there is an AC group delete, which will res uh, delete your resource group and all the child uh, cloud resources under it. So make sure that you capture this command so you can easily just restore your cloud shell and make sure you know your credits is not being spent. That's important for us. Only spend it for business purposes, right? Not for learning. Right. Uh, so we're going to head back to uh, PowerPoint at this point. That's two points in one sentence, right? Uh, yes. So we have talked about setting up the environment. So real a quick recap. We have run a deployment script, or Swami has run it. He has waited 10 minutes, and you saw what happened into the future. We got a bunch of code. It's being deployed. Um, there's also a front now that looks like that, that t-shirt that Swam is going to buy me, right? Uh, I'm actually going to force him to buy it. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet, but it's on live. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so we have already built it. That is great. We will review the app configuration concept at this point. And there are a few things that we want to have a look at. Let's see. One second. There. Uh, first off, what we want to look at is the uh, ASP.NET configuration infrastructure. Now, ASP.NET has a specific way of uh, reading configuration from various places. Uh, secondly, we want to look at the Kubernetes configuration abstraction and the config map. The config map is something that Swami uh, slightly uh, touched on when he was showing you all the things that happen under the Helm directory. Thirdly, the Azure app configuration service is something that we will uh, be using. We will uh, show you a case where it actually motivates to move from the configurations being very close to the application to actually centralize them and put them in a service in the cloud. Then we will also uh, cover something called the .NET feature management library, which is a NuGet package that we will use. And uh, we will also talk about implementation of the feature flag and the components, because we will implement those on the Angular side of things, on the client, as well as the ASP.NET Core application. Uh, right. One thing we wanted to note is that because nowadays .NET doesn't just run in Windows, it uh, can be deployed in, and run in Mac. I'm on a Mac. I'm definitely building .NET applications on a Mac. You could be on Linux, that should work as well. But as you move into these various operating systems, they got different standards. So we can't use colon anymore. We need to use as delimiter when we create our keys, we need to use a double underscore. So here you have an example here at the bottom, uh, feature management, double underscore coupons that would make this flag or, or, or um, sorry, this config work perfectly in various environments. So. Sorry, no more colons. If, if Windows folks, if you love your colons, sorry, you can't use that anymore. Now, uh, let's talk about ASP.NET uh, Core configuration. Uh, it has a concept of providers. Now, providers is usually a way for us to say, well, there are different functions that's able to read data from somewhere. So by adding a provider, you add a capability. One such provider is the ability to read from appsettings.json, a JSON file that you get when you scaffold the new ASP.NET uh, project. Uh, you can also have various versions of this JSON file, such as the appsettings.dev.json or .staging or .prod. You can imagine yourself, right? For every single environment, you might have different values for this. Thirdly, you can have user secrets. There's a secrets management system. If you're not using that uh, already, please start using it. It will be a great separator uh, between yeah. code and configuration. So quickly, Swami, why shouldn't I have the secrets inside of my source code? Excellent question. Uh, it, it's to do with the security for the first reason, right? Basically, we don't want everyone to see the connection strings or whatever. We want to obviously protect our connection settings or any of the secrets. So it's definitely a no to put it into any of these app settings, JSONs, or any of your configuration files, right? Uh, in the local development, definitely we can use user secrets. But when we move it into the cloud, we have other offerings like Azure Key Vault and different other walls, which is what you would use. 
right? That is one. And also externalizing the configuration is another important aspect, right? Let's say if you're building a microservices-based architecture, and one of the recommendations of the 12-factor app is to, you know, externalize your configuration, right? That has its own uh, benefits. So you don't want to redeploy every time when you want to change a, a specific configuration value, right? And that's where mm -hmm. some of these configuration providers built into .NET is going to help us achieve that those, uh, those benefits. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Excellent, Swami. So yeah, don't put your secrets in your code. Definitely don't check that into your repo because yeah. what happens in the future when someone gets read access, you are being compromised. So get in the habit of separating those and leverage all of those services that we are about to show you as Swami was mentioning. Now, uh, another place that uh, configuration values can come from is the environment variables as well. Uh, those can always override if you got files where you specify one value and then, you know, one of the, your last resorts of actually changing those variables would be uh, environment uh, variables. It can also come from the command line. Yeah. Uh, right, so I'm another question. Um, mm -hmm. Imagine that I am using Kubernetes. I have copies mm -hmm. of my app running in thousands of pods. Mm -hmm. uh, what problems will I face and uh, how should I think about configuration? Okay, excellent question. I think yeah, we all understood now with Chris' uh, explanation that for a specific .NET application, we we can use these any of these options, right? Like either you put an app setting JSON file or secrets or what environment variables. Now, extending to that, let's say we've we've deployed it to thousand instances, like Chris mentioned. Now, obviously, yes, each of them will get its own app settings JSON, but how if we want to make a change to it, then it's going to be a redeployment of all those pods, right? That's when you'll have a concept called config maps in Kubernetes. Uh, maybe if you can go to the next slide, I can also explain it a little better, right? So config map is, is a way to externalize the configurations from your application. Right? Irrespective of the number of pods you are running, all your configs you'll put into a Kubernetes manifest called config maps. And when your pod comes up, it will read the configuration from the config map and then it will get injected as an environment variable for your container, right? That's one of the ways to you know address the problem of having multiple replicas of a single application or a single microservice. Right. Yeah, that's exactly so, what uh, we are talking about here, right? So basically, if, if you want to create a config map, you will create YAML. It basically, config map is in YAML. It's in YAML syntax, right? It's like yet another uh, uh, file, like if you, how you are creating and deployment YAML or a service YAML. On the same lens, you'll create a config map dot YAML file where you can specify what is the config map name and then what are the data and things like that. It will definitely see what are the elements of config map in the demo. Right. So one part is yes. First thing is you store it in the YAML format, and then, like I said, when the container starts up, it's going to be presented as an environment variable to the container. Right. And it also it's the primary mechanism to uh, to basically to inject all these configuration values for a .NET Core application. So if you are on if you are deploying a .NET Core based app to Kubernetes, definitely we recommend to use a config map to externalize the configuration. You'll also see the benefits of it when we show the demo. Right? We are not going to redeploy the, or rebuild the image every time when we want to change the configuration. We'll only change in the config map, and you just redeploy the config map, and your application will start working automatically. Yeah. Right. So uh, I mentioned something at the beginning of this talk, which was feature flags. Uh, you've heard the term feature flags maybe a few times, but I'm going to define what we mean by it and why we should be using it. Now, feature flags enables you to ship code early. Meaning that uh, imagine that you're working on a feature instead of it taking maybe three weeks to implement, you don't want that feature branch to be alive for that long because you're going to have a very painful time to integrate towards the, your main branch, right? So what you want is some kind of early way to integrate your code and make sure it's out there, but it's risky. You, you say, Chris, what about this feature isn't done, right? At that point, you can kind of protect your feature by um, putting it under a feature flag so it can only be enabled for you. And also, if you're working on a very complicated system, such as microservices, for example, there are so many things that are moving parts that, you know, you want to test everything locally to the best of your ability, but sometimes you just need to deploy it. Right, so the point with the feature flag is to make sure that things are being deployed in a dormant, in sleeping stage, and then activated later. So avoid difficult code integrations because you have a complicated live environment, but also that you now have the ability to show this live to stakeholders and say, hey, wait a minute, Chris is just going to enable this uh, coupon feature for you because you're the CTO or CEO or whatever kind of C-suite level position you have. I'm showing you this and I'm telling you, do you like what you see? If you get a thumbs up, uh, you can just remove that feature flag, right? But if you don't get it and they tell you to do various changes, 
you don't risk exposing anything to your users and you're safe you know um, under that feature flag and yeah you can also do some kind of control testing if you and your team want to make sure that all those moving parts are actually working as they should now uh, Azure app configuration we can definitely move that to the uh, to the cloud uh, what we're getting is that we get we go from configuration that lives very close to our app towards having them live in a service in the cloud so it will be centralized and it's very very useful in microservices apps because they might read from the same databases that maybe some admin application that's not a microservice application also want to read from. And you know the very nature of microservices app is that there's a lot of moving parts, right? Distributed applications. Now, configuration, as we said before, as Swam explained to us, should be separated from code. Um, reading configuration data is difficult when you have a complex system and you have a complex architecture. And the solution here is to use a cloud-based service. And Swami now, he's going to tell us all about that a little bit more in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Azure App Configuration has a lot of benefits, right? Why we are going to use Azure App Configuration. One example is, or one of the key benefits is we have a flexible key representations and mappings. So what we mean by that is, let's say if, uh, when you are working with a um, file-based configuration, right? we have, we just learned that app settings are JSON is a common file. And you can also have environment-specific JSON files where you'll go and put your dev development-specific values or uh, maybe testing-specific or production-specific uh, configuration values, right? If you want to maintain that hierarchy and everything, you can very well do that with the app configuration as well by using different uh, types of keys and things like that, right? Plus, yeah, we also have more benefits. Yeah, we can also tag with labels. So labels is one of the ways how you can also categorize these environments, uh, right? Uh, dev specific labels will be pulled up when your application is running in development environment and your production specific labels could be pulled when, you are, when your application is running in production environment, right? Plus, we also have other things. And another important thing is you can also do a point in time replay of settings. So a lot of times we would have faced issues like, you know what, last week the particular issue happened. And when we go and try and troubleshoot it, we never knew what was happening or what was the configuration or what was the state of the configuration around that time frame, right? So all those would be gone now unless you are maintaining everything in a GitHub uh, or in a centralized version control system, which is also another best practice, right? Since we're talking about configurations here. So this Azure app configuration also gives a uh, uh, point in time replay of all the settings, whatever was present right and you don't have to again spend another additional effort to build any kind of an ui to build your feature flag management so typically uh, your product owners or anyone would need to go and toggle the feature on and off depending on the need right so there is a built-in dedicated ui available in azure portal itself to to enable or disable your feature flags right and so what i'm hearing here uh, the swami is that you you have a reason to blame chris right he, who changed that setting last week i have a point in yes. time replay is pointing at chris i did it i'm guilty right yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's not a point thing, but at least we'll get to know the history, right? <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, and also it also gives the comparison of two configurations. Let's say well, if you want to check, okay, when, when was the feature enabled versus when was the feature disabled? And if you want to look at time comparison, basically last week, what was the configuration state versus what is the current configuration state? You can also do that comparison because you have an option to do a replay of settings, right? Both of these are coherent, yeah. And plus, all, we can also, it also has an enhanced security. So though in this particular session, we are going to talk about how we are going to read the configuration from a Kubernetes application, right? Or an application running within Kubernetes. You, uh, if, you are, if you are using or if you're deploying maybe like an Azure app service or an Azure function where your .NET or any kind of application is deployed, right? You can still be able to uh, get the uh, configuration values from Azure app configuration by using Azure managed identities. That's another additional security for us, right? And plus, all these will be talking about configuration and then security, right? So obviously, you are not going to put your connection strings or any of the secrets into the app configuration, right? You would definitely put it into Azure Key Vault, and then you will give the Key Vault reference in your Azure App Configuration, and then you will pull it in your code, right? That said, Azure App Configuration also has an encryption built in, right? Uh, both at rest and also in transit. So let's say if you're trying to retrieve the value from the, when I say value, the configuration value from the Azure App Configuration from AKS, right? So the AKS to your Azure App Configuration channel is also you know, encrypted. Basically, the data is encrypted in that particular channel, right? And though our area focus is .NET in this session, but Azure App Configuration also has support for other, other uh, uh, frameworks. Like if you're working on Java Spring or if you're working on Python also, you could definitely use Azure App Configuration and then you can pull the secrets from there or the configurations from there. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think you mentioned it, but there's a lot of popular mm -hmm. frameworks where we could be using this, right? I don't need to be on yeah. .NET to be used this, right? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 
But with but .NET, we will use the uh, app, uh, sorry, the ASP.NET Core configuration providers. That also brings another abstraction for us. It's a lot easier, which is what we would you know show in the demo. Yeah. So these are some of the feature, uh, some of the benefits of Azure App Configuration. Now getting into the feature management in Azure App Configuration, right? So what are the different options we have within Azure App Configuration? So first thing is simple feature flags. So what we mean by that is you definitely have an option to give you a feature flag name and then do a checkbox. Then if you click the checkbox, it is enabled. And if you uncheck it, it is just disabled. It's, it's that easy. You don't have to do anything else and go, go and figure out what is said where and et cetera, right? So you have an option to set simple feature flags or if you want to extend your feature management to a uh, next level by, by adding feature filters, right? So there are three different types of filters available. So one of the things which I would like is like to talk about is the targeting thing, right? Where like Chris mentioned, if you want to target a specific set of users, maybe if you want to enable ring-based deployments and if you want to enable specific features for your beta users or if you want to enable specific features for your alpha users or whoever, right? You can, uh, you can set those as well, uh, right? Uh, using the targeting feature filters. Or if you want to enable a feature flag during a specific time window, even that is possible, right? Let's say I want to enable only during maybe today is what, 8th, and I want to start this feature from 10th, and then I want to run it only till 12th of February. I could very well do that as well. Or if you want to enable this feature for a percentage of requests, for example, I want to enable this feature for only 10% of my requests and maybe the remaining 90 I want I don't want to enable and I want to gather some feedback with this 10% of users and then maybe if I want to increment, uh, you know, in an incremental fashion, we should be able to do that as well. Right? Those are some other feature filters which are available as well. Right? So, uh, Swami, this seems uh, really useful, right? So, let's say I develop this coupon feature. I can just target the CEO, for example, and show him the coupon code, right? I would be using yeah. this uh, user targeting, am I right? Yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah, and also now talking about the features. So now we, we understood that, yeah, there's a centralized place where the features flags are going to be maintained in Azure App Configuration, right? Now, how would our application be uh, able to pull those particular uh, configuration changes, right? That is where we also have two models. One is a pull-based refresh. That means you can cache the tokens, or, or not the tokens, you can cache the entire configuration values in your application, in our case, a .NET application. And we can set and cache expiry, maybe like five seconds or 10 seconds, depending on the need. And then after every 10 seconds, the, the provider will automatically go and hit the Azure app configuration, and then it will pull the uh, updated value. So that means all you need to wait is maybe like five seconds or 10 seconds, depending on the interval, whatever we are setting. Right, that's around pull-based refresh, but there's also push-based refresh as well, right? So if you wanna don't want to wait for it, and then if you want to make it more of event-driven, even that is possible. So we can set up an Azure Event Grid integration with the Azure App configuration, so that anytime a, con a configuration value is changed, it will trigger an Azure Event Grid event, and then you can have your event listener on your code, and then that can automatically re receive that event, and then it can refresh the configuration values. So there are a lot of uh, options available. We can pick and choose whichever works for us in our use cases. Right. So Swami, can you build me then a mobile app so I would be able to get this event every time you change your value to a feature flag, right? We can make yeah. that happen, right? Yes, absolutely. You can also set some, set some alerts, right? Let's see if you want to know who when the feature flag is changed, you can also connect that with an Azure monitor and then you can also set, some, set up some alerts. Nice. Yeah. It opens up a lot of possibilities and opportunities for us. All right. So let's talk a little bit about feature flags in, in the context of .NET, right? Because now we're going to go into a specific implementation. As we said before, this is not limited to .NET. Uh, you can definitely use uh, the Azure Config service from, from um, because it's cloud-based. You can use that with Python or whatever have you, right? But today we're talking .NET. Now, there are two different options. Uh, there's a feature management library, depending on which one you use. You either use it to target the more generic version in which you have a .NET backend and maybe a frontend in JavaScript, could be Angular, could be React, Svelte, or, or some JavaScript framework we never heard about that's arriving in two weeks, right? Or you could be using the other version of this, which is the ASP.NET Core one. Were you to use that one, we are using both, by the way, you are getting something called tag help helpers, and that is for race abuse. So if you have the need to show the values of feature flags um, in, in both uh, settings, meaning in either the Angular app and JavaScript, or you want to have a server-side rendered page, where you would be using the other one for that purpose. So two different flavors. We are using both. You might use one or the other. Um, let's see here. Right. Uh, there are a few components here that we uh, want to care about. Uh, so we have mentioned a few times already that we have a web spa that we're going to have a closer look at. 
it contains both JavaScript uh, project with, with Angular and it also contains ASP.NET. Uh, and uh, our mission here is to make everything configurable, right? So let's have a look at the web spa and what we're about to do, because uh, in our next ex exercise, we are about to add this feature. Now, looking at the web spa, it is built inside of Angular. And Angular, of course, is an application framework that ends up creating these primitives, right? So HTML files, JavaScript files, CSS, you know the works. Angular has a few different concepts that's going to make it easier for you. It's using directives and services, for example to uh, render various things, right? So you have HTML that is be being rendered and then you have JavaScript code that you would typically put in service. What you're looking at here at the top of this image is a div uh, HTML element. And you see this feature flag thing starting with the star. This is Angular's way of saying here we have a directive, something in the HTML DOM that I need to interpret and turn that into something. And that something is the coupons that we choose to visualize or don't show, right? And in the corresponding JavaScript code, we would read that state. And depending on that state, you would see that div or you wouldn't see it. Now, um, also, there is uh, the concept of the .NET app, the ASP.NET Core app. There is a server-side rendered uh, page. So as I said, we are using both these NuGet offerings. So in the racer view, we, we, we would have this feature uh, that would be able to render coupons uh, or not render them depending on the value of the state. There's also the concept of middleware, which hooks into the request pipeline to make sure that it knows how to handle it. And yeah, uh, as part of the configuration API, we are about to show you some additions that we are about to add to the config map. So you see two values here at the bottom right, use feature management true as well as the other one called feature management double underscore coupons and that value being true as well. You're going to see all these changes, but this is just a high level view. We will change the UI, we will change the backend, and we will be in there in, in the config for Helm and do some changes as well. Now, um, looking at the feature flag uh, uh, directive for Angular views, what we're saying is, is essentially this. We know that we will implement an app config uh, store uh, over time. We're not doing that exactly right now, but we will. And once uh, the data or, or the config data lives centrally, we will have a client application. It will talk to a backend that will talk to the cloud. Uh, before we get that far, we will uh, implement the feature flag directive. Uh, so we, we are going to create a file called feature flag.directive.ts. This is just a naming standard. And we need to call a get features function. Uh, get feature function called uh, a service, as I said. So directive calls a service, constructs a URL that hits the backend, which in this case is an ASP.NET um, service. The response from that request is what we end up rendering on the client side of things. So we're still just talking client. Moving on here, uh, we can see that this is what the code file will look like that we're going to do. And we have highlighted the part that's interesting, which is us calling the feature flag. Don't worry if you don't understand Angular, D just as long as you understand what goes on in this highlighted uh, line here, which is us doing this web request. We're asking for the value of the feature flag. Please tell us the value, get that back, and then we uh, re-render the view. Now, the other bit here is the service itself. Uh, it is doing this web request. So it's going somewhere towards our ASP.NET Core application. Uh, and uh, yeah, so feature uh, slash feature name, right? That's where it's heading. And uh, we're still on the UI side of things. This is just an interface. You know, interfaces from C Sharp. It's pretty much the same thing in TypeScript. Yeah. In fact, I'm not sure you would even see the difference if you were coding C-sharp and TypeScript unless you really squint, right? Yeah. Um, feature management middleware, uh, why we are using that thing is because we can't go directly from the client towards the Azure config service. We need to talk to this backend in between. That's why I had this cross here uh, on the right side of things, the image. We can't go from Spa app to Azure. We need to go to the backend in between. Now, uh, yeah, so the client would be enabled or the feature would be enabled by the value of the HTTP request. And yeah, we go from client, we go towards the backend. Once we go towards the backend, we communicate with the .NET feature, uh, feature management library to understand the value. 
And yeah, lastly here, before we uh, think venture into the, uh, an exercise, is that we will talk about the tag helper. Now the tag helper is something that we use to render things, server-side render. So JavaScript is not involved here. We are only reading the configuration value and render that page in Razor. So a tag helper is a custom tag. You don't need to create it. The only thing you need to do is to install the NuGet package. Then you will get that tag helper. Um, as I said, server-side rendered. And yeah, you wouldn't need it if you are 100% dependent on a JavaScript spa. However, in this case, we have both because we like to showcase all the features. Now, a little uh, knowledge check, just to make sure that you're all still alive. I know it's still early in Europe, and I know probably it's a bit in the afternoon in India, but for the Europeans, let's wake you up, am I right? Uh, yeah, I just want to put your attention to the aka.ms slash polls. This is where you would go to uh, give us your vote. Uh, I'm going to read the question, then Swami is going to read the, or explain the alternative, so you would understand at the end of that which one you should be choosing. Question being this, what is the key abstraction that supports the configuration system in ASP.NET Core apps? Swami, can you take us mm -hmm. through the options? Yeah, definitely. That's an interesting question. So the option A says feature management library. Uh, that looks very specific to feature management per se. And option B is around configuration provider. Okay, that has a configuration. It's synonymous to the question. And then we also have config map. Okay, I think the config map we discussed, it's more to do with the Kubernetes side of it. And then Azure app configuration, it's also again specifically on the Azure app side of it, right? So I think my guess would be B should be the answer, but I'll wait for others to see if everyone was able to follow through us, right? Okay, we're gonna give it a, a few more seconds before the polls mm -hmm. show up. Hopefully you have yeah. already voted and... Yeah, I can see for... Well, the results coming up yeah how's our audience are they awake yeah fantastic all right then so uh we know that okay. the correct answer to this question is the configuration provider now yeah. we're going to go into the second exercise here so you would see an implementation of the feature management mm -hmm. library so you would understand all the moving parts uh, I will just quickly first show you high level what the exercise looked like, and then we will switch over to Swami, who will take you through the, the various steps. Mm -hmm. One second. There we go. So uh, looking at uh, our module, let's look at it high level. And so far, we have gone through all the concepts that you need to know at this point. We have set up an environment. We can see that it's mm -hmm. up and running, perfect. We have reviewed all the various concepts, so you should know everything about feature flags, cloud services, and whatnot, right? And now we are at the point where we want to implement the feature management library. And uh, we will, uh, I believe, switch over to you, uh, Swami, right? To your screen. Yeah. Sure. All right. I have my cloud shell ready here. So like I showed in the few minutes back, we have the code explorer on top and we have the commands here, right? So first thing what I will do is I'll walk you through the application. I know we've been talking about the .NET uh, eShop on containers app, right? So first let's look at the application and then we'll also look at uh, the other aspects of it, right? Yeah. If in case your cloud shell got terminated as you were listening to this or so, right, then you can always reconnect it. And then when you go inside this folder where you are... Uh, Code is, uh, code is pulled in, right? You can see this deployment URLs.txt file. So if you just do an cat of that, that will give you the AKS instance URLs. So you don't have to remember anything. So just click on that and that will open the web SPA URL. So basically this is our container live application which is running and here is where we are going to, you know, apply the feature toggling, all right? So this has all these nice products here. I have a similar one, not a hoodie though, but a t-shirt. And yeah, so you can also have a login functionality here, all right? So just a quick uh, call out. So this is a demo application. So as you can see, the username and passwords are put in here. So please don't ever, never ever do that, right? <laughs> just for ease of demo, we don't want to scramble around here and there to remember the password. So it's, it's captured here. So once you log in, uh, right? And you, you should be able to add any items to the cart. So maybe I like this mug. And then I also like this .NET Foundation t-shirt. I'll add both of them. And you can see, if you go to the basket here, you can see two items are added. And when I click on those, you, you should see the totals. And when you go to checkout, 
is where this is where you will give your shipping address payment etc and our area of interest is this section here right see available coupons and then the coupon number and apply if you want to play around with you can also click on this see available coupons that opens up the coupons page available coupons and then maybe i need 30 percentage discounts so i'll just copy this code of 30 and i'll go here and then just paste it and that's it you should get oh wow that's cool <laughs> you don't have to pay anything give me money back then <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, anyways yeah so now what we are going to do next is let's see how this particular coupon page or the coupon uh, addition can be you know feature toggled you're right just prior to implementing that i also would like to look into a couple more other things right so if you look at uh, the the output from that particular deployments urls file there are three things one it talks about the web sp application and then the other thing is around the web status right so this is another important and interesting thing in in microservices application right you need to know how all of your applications what is the health of all of your applications not applications all of your microservices sorry so in this case for example web spa is dependent on identity as we just saw right so if identity is down maybe web spa would be down and if you go and look at ordering, maybe the ordering HTTP microservice is dependent on ordering DB, and then it is also checking the health of RabbitMQ connectivity, etc. Right? So this is another. This piece is coming due to an, a health check middleware, which is also integrated into this, into this code base. Right? So whenever you build a microservice based application, it's always good to know what service is available and what is not. Right? So having a health health dashboard is is very very important. And in this sample, it's already uh, available out of the box for us. Right? So you can also go around and explore here. So when we redeploy it, I will show how these health check changes, right? It says healthy and or ego because that's when it executed. And the refresh time is every 10 seconds. Uh, so we can also see that how it refreshes live when we start making code changes, right? And then if you want to explore the logs further, you can go here. Uh, this, this tries to bring the entire uh, logs of all the different microservices into one place. Right. See, we've been running only health checks. So that, that's what you would see here. Execute endpoint health checks. And this is coming from maybe which this is coming from the middleware here. Uh, right. Like this, you can go ahead and look at different different calls and then how the uh, API logs are coming up from different microservices. See, the reason why I'm trying to stress this point is imagine if you're a monolithic application, everything is going to be a function call for you, right? You'll call from method A to method B, and then all the logs will be written in a single place. But now it's not the case, right? It, with microservices, every microservice writes logs into its own uh, log, uh, maybe a console or whatever, right? So you need a place where you can see everything at once so that you'll be able to correlate things or what's happening, right? Okay, with that bit of introduction to the code base, and uh, sorry, not the code base, the application, maybe let's start making the code changes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the first step we need to cool. do to ensure is that we have the NuGet package. So we will bring home uh, something called the ASP.NET uh, core package. Uh, I believe we have a command to make that easy. Uh, yeah. But what you're doing essentially is to call .NET add uh, package, Microsoft feature man management.ASP.NET mm -hmm. core. Yeah. I hope I'm in the right location. Let me do this. OK. I expected that. OK. Right. So the important part here is the add package. So if you just put yourself in the .NET uh, project, you can just call yeah. .NET add as you're used to if you're a .NET mm -hmm. developer. Yeah. Maybe as that adds, maybe we can move on to the next code changes, and then we can uh, come back to this, right? It's basically trying to do an, uh, a NuGet package addition is what is happening here. For right? sure. For sure. Yeah. So our next step on our journey is to go into the config map YAML file in, in the Helm, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm already there. As if you recollect during the config maps presentation, I talked about it's going to be in a YAML format. So this is how you'll create the config map YAML. So the kind tells it's config map. That's mean that means it's a config map manifest, right? And the name of this config map is web SPA config map. And this is what would be used in your deployment YAML. I'll also quickly show that as well. Right. If you go to deployment YAML, you should see the environment from right, which is config map ref. The name of this config map is web SPA CM. That means for this container, all the environment variables are going to be injected or going to be are, are coming from uh, this particular config map, which is that web SPCM, right? Now, if you go back there, you can see all of these elements. So these are the different configuration values uh, which is, which are going to be made available as an environment variable, right? Now, moving on to our demo. So we, as you can see, there are two entries here. Right? One is for use feature management, and second one is around the feature management coupons. Right? Note the under usage of double underscore. Right, because this particular app is running in a Linux container, so to ensure cross-platform, we kind of put it in this fashion. Right? So uh, there's another place we can put these values as well, right? We can go inside of our ASP.NET app and, and add uh, add these values as well. And, and I think the whole point is that 
you have a first yeah. place where you can read these config values and then you have a second point in which you can override it and so on. So we have a lot of points right. where you can override the value. So yeah, inside right. of our ASP.NET uh, application in the app settings.json file, we can add this yeah. entry as well. Yes, right. And if you all recollect the order in which slide the slide in the slide which Chris showed, right? So first thing is ASP.NET Core will look from the app settings file and that will be overridden by whatever if you have in the secrets and then on the environment variables and then it will be overridden by command line. Right. So basically it's all in the, in the order of registration of the providers. So whatever you write in the app settings are JSON. For example, if you put any of the use feature flag management as false or so, and in the config map, if you are overriding it, then that is the value which in ASP.NET Core application will take up. Because in the order, config maps are not the config maps, the environment variables take precedence over the setting in the JSON files. Yeah. So please be mindful of that part as well in which location you're putting and then what is the order of it. Otherwise, you might again uh, get into unnecessary issues. Right. Right. So it's important so, uh, to send that order. Uh, our next step here is to go into the startup CS file because uh, we will uh, tell our ASP.NET application to use feature management. Right. Um, yeah. So if we locate the startup CS, there's first we're going to start in a method called configure services, or we can just enable that namespace. I think you did that mm -hmm. on the top. Uh, yes, right. exactly that that place. Uh, we need to add some code here that's trying to uh, get the value from use feature management. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, yeah. yeah, exactly. So you're grabbing the feature management and then you're calling services dot add feature management, which will add the capability, right? Yeah. And uh, there's another place in uh, uh, configure as well. So we do a similar yeah. thing in, in configure, but this time around we call endpoints.map feature management. So uh, yeah. first step, we told it about the capability. Second step was to say, now actually use it. Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, so there's a piece of middleware. Can we show the middleware maybe in the uh, um, extensions yeah. part of the web spa? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have the middleware created here, right? The feature management middleware. So and middleware is another interesting concept in ASP.NET Core, right? You can create a lot of things using middleware. You can also write custom middlewares. So what we have done here is an endpoint uh, routing. Basically, you are creating an endpoint, right? If I go here to this, as we can see, this is a pattern says features, right? That means this particular web SPA's base URL slash features, if you get hit it, right? This particular middleware will come into picture and then it will uh, return the response. And what it is going to do is it's going to basically pull all the feature flags and and send and expose it to the SPA, SPA nothing but single page application, right? Like Chris pointed out, our client is an Angular based application which will not understand the .NET side of things, right? So for our uh, single page application to understand what feature is enabled or not is where we've exposed this middleware. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, I think you mentioned this Swami already, but middleware can be used in a lot of contexts, right? We could do it for logging, yeah. error management, auth. So middleware is great. If you have a request pipeline, you have a piece yeah. of code that needs to run as part of that request. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And there are different ways you can implement middleware. If in case you want to inject something in the pipeline, then you can also trigger the next uh, uh, middleware in the pipeline. Or if you don't want to do it, it's called a terminating middleware, where this is this is an example of a terminating middleware, right? Where this is going to uh, intercept the request and then it is going to process the request uh, completely. Right. So now as part of your code, you've been inside of the config map, you've added stuff to .NET Core uh, project. We, we have yet to add changes in the Angular app, right? And yeah, there's right. a deploy script that we could use. What this deploy yeah. script does is called implement directive. It's essentially mm -hmm. to augment some existing files with the feature flag instruction. So it will add some stuff to your divs in your HTML code. Um, yeah. yeah. And I believe I you it might also have... talks about that order detail component, right? So let me go on quickly right. open that order part. detail dot component dot HTML. So just saying yeah. we're doing this on the HTML side of things. So yeah, right. So don't worry about this part. Our focus is mostly on the .NET side of it and how we are going to feature toggle it. So that's why the script is also created. We're not going to go and modify this manually, right? Um, so this is going to enable the a single page application to understand the feature flag and it's going to dynamically render this particular component. Yeah, that's about it. Right, so uh, what would happen now is because the feature is always on, were we to add this code to the UI, what I would see is either I would see my uh, coupons, right? If everything is on, and if it's off, I would be shown with a, an error message or an information message that would tell me, sorry, yeah. you don't have this feature enabled. That's what's going to happen by implementing this code. Uh, yeah. There's also a race view, right? 
So if yep. you go inside of coupon status uh, slash index CS HTML inside of the, yep. you're there already, right? Yes, so at, at the top, we're looking at exactly what you're highlighting. We're looking at adding the namespace for it, right? Mm -hmm. So we are saying, yep. I want to use this tag helper. And then there's a partial uh, lower down in the code that we are about to replace. Yeah, right. So let me quickly replace this partial mm -hmm. uh, with this sort of code, right? So basically, we are enabling the feature toggling here, right? Uh, so as you can see here, I think the formatting is a bit odd. Let me try to correct that. Yeah, so this is a nice feature. So this is what the tag helper is helping us. So we, we are, it's clearly uh, it's clear for us that it's a feature named coupons. And negate equal to true means whenever that feature is not enabled, what do we want to render? That's what is this particular line talks about. You are not subscribed to this feature. And whenever a feature is enabled, it's going to render this particular uh, partial view. Uh, right? Right. So now right. that we did all the needed changes, right? Because we've mm -hmm. changed the config, we changed the uh, .NET app, we changed the mm -hmm. Angular application. So we are ready to rebuild and tell uh, Azure Kubernetes service that we have a change, right? Yeah. Oops. What happened? Deploy kids. OK. Shop um, registry and is your shop name. It always happens in live demos, right? <laughs> yeah. I think you might need to stand under source, right? Yeah, I, I do have that. So maybe let me do that, Kate. And then let me say build. That. Okay, build to. I mean, if you go two levels up, I think you're two levels down right now, right? You're in, oh, yeah. standing okay. in, in source as your root folder. So, yeah. Okay. Let me. And then you run deploy slash k8 and build to, yeah, all the rest. Yes. And then. And then uh, dash dash services, services web spa. And I'm surprised. I think you're missing the flag to the command, right? So I, I think it needs oh, dash okay. dash services and then web spa. Okay. Yeah. Even if I give that. It says eShop registry and the eShop ACR name. Did I miss any step in provisioning the ACR? Let me quickly check that once. If I go to my resource groups and eShop learn. Yeah, I can see that it's available here. The container registry is available. Yeah, the repositories are present. Okay. Did you add the config to the .NET part of things? I'm not sure you went into the yeah. app settings JSON file, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't go there. Uh, so basically, yeah, the ACR is not able to identify my uh, this one, All right? Uh, to to push it. Right. Uh, tables are missing. Build to ACR dot sh is what I'm running. Mm -hmm. It should ideally actually build. Basically, it should build my image and then push it into the ACR, right? So if I go and look at this build to ACR. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I think this is what it is telling. I might need to set my registry and the ACR name. Yeah, uh, look, uh, basically my uh, cloud shell uh, got terminated in middle. Maybe I think some of these environment variables got deleted because of that. Uh, right. Uh, just give me a second. Shop registry. It should say shop registry. I think I'm here. Set dollar. Should equal to. So if you were to run this exercise in in one go, you should probably be good. But if you have a long Correct. running session, you know this might. Yeah. Happen. All right. Correct. Yeah. So let me go to my. This is my login server, right? Okay. Let me grab that up, and then set that here. Should be fine. Oops, it's not a valid identifier. How does it? Ah, I, I think you have this uh, trailing yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, it says it's not. Okay. I don't think you used a dollar in the beginning, right? Or are you? It's just yeah, it's the it's key equals value, I think. Okay, yeah. 
Maybe that's happy. Okay. Yeah, my bad. Right, and the ACR name. Uh, so the Azure Container Registry name, right? Yeah. So the name should be. Oops, what happened here? Go here. You should learn RG. So ah. welcome to the real world, right? Where you know, <laughs> things don't work as the demo. Um, yeah. Fortunately, we're able to grab these values, I believe. Fi should is your name is is let me try running it once again and see if it's able to do that uh -huh. okay i think yeah this would take a bit of time so basically it needs to run this entire instructions in the docker file right so if you go into the docker file of this spa right so here is where we are trying to you know build the entire uh, .NET image and then we are also trying to uh, host this particular client side components into a node.js server etc right it has close to 25 steps so it might take a bit of time to run all of these right meanwhile if there are any questions maybe we could take that up right do you have anything on the uh, yeah the so we said before to define the term spa uh, i know you're saying single page application that's what it means mm -hmm. the difference between uh, normal javascript framework in a spa application is that a spa a single page app simply means you have one page right and you're not leaving that yeah. page and what you're after is a client like experience so imagine that you're on the web but you wanted to run like microsoft excel for example the only yeah. way to achieve that is to stay in the same page but you have some magic javascript that makes sure that it switches out the contents of various views so angular is such a example framework React is more of a view library, most people mm -hmm. would say, but you will add, you know, components to it to make it into a framework. Svelte is another uh, thing. Vue is, is another. Yeah. And of course, Blazor, right? If you're on .NET. Yeah. yeah. So if you don't want to work on any of other multiple variants of JavaScript, yeah, Blazor is the way to go. Yeah. And especially with .NET 6, it has even got a lot of improvements, right? And if you're still missing your JavaScript, there is a, a JavaScript uh, thing that you can connect with inside a Blazor, so you can run that JavaScript. Yeah. But I have a feeling yeah. if you're using Blazor, you're more prone to C Sharp, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, only for things which you can't accomplish with C Sharp, you can go ahead with the, with the JavaScript interoperability, right? Right. OK, yeah, like and, I said, it's uh, going to take some time. Meanwhile, if there are any other uh, parts, if you want to explore uh, here in the code, can quickly it's show just running that. at the speed of internet right or, or... yeah yeah right yeah. maybe you can show, take us through the various steps what's happening from the top of the docker file sure yeah that is that's good right so yeah so basically what we are trying to do is we are setting the node image version here and then this is the place where we are trying to use a base image right so when we are working with an docker images right so what we need to be sure is whenever the application comes up it needs to be really fast that's one thing the image startup time should be fast and second thing is the image size should uh, should be as slim as possible right? we don't want to put everything in the docker image right that's why as the name says this is one of the 3.1 version uh, slim version of the expert runtime that is what we are trying to use it here, right? And this is while running the application, right? But when you want to build the application, you need a, a .NET SDK, right? That is what we'll see in the bottom, right? But before that, we're also trying to do the NPM package because it also has the Angular side of it. As you can see, it does an NPM install, and then it's also trying to do an NPM run build. Actually, I'm, as I talk about it, that's where we are here, right? It's also doing an ahead of time compilation of the Angular uh, project, right? Here is where all of your Angular related stuffs are getting packaged. And then here is where we are trying to use this image. As you can see now, this is an SDK image right? because SDK is what you would need to build your application. Let's say if you want to do an .NET restore or .NET build, that needs an SDK on that particular machine, right? That is where we are pulling this image and then we are trying to, you know, build this particular SPACS project, right? We are doing a .NET restore and then copying the contents into that. And what we would finally do is from this build, we are trying to publish our .NET application, right? Again, .NET build will create all your DLs and PDBs, et cetera, right? So to, to even further slim it down, we would use a .NET publish with and release configuration. That's what is happening here. And finally, what we will do is, as you can see, this from base as final, right? That means on this particular image, it's been a 23.1 buster slim image, we're adding additional layers of the, our application where it is going to have this .NET web -based period DLL. Right. And this is an example of a multi-stage Docker build, if you have not heard about it, right, where we are trying to chain different activities. Right? So if here we are using one of the images as you are doing it and then from and you are trying to, you know, copy things from one layer into another layer. All these things are possible because we're using multi-stage build here. Right. 
So now what happens is when this particular container comes up, it is going to you know run .NET and then WebSP.dll. This particular application will be running. It's as good as how we all run in the local machine. Right. And I can see it has finished, right? So it's okay. pushed yeah. in a new image. Am I right? Uh, right. Yeah. So now the next step is deploying it into the Kubernetes. Right? So we just created an image now, but we have still not deployed it. Right. So let me go ahead and quickly do that. So deploy application charts web SPA. Ah, it's happening. Shop live, shop dev command to shop distribution, shop command distribution deployment. Couldn't resolve the host name, either use host IP or the host name. Okay, maybe let me do that. It's being really friendly though, giving you a hint. <laughs> <It could> be. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Export eShop underscore industry equal to eShop dev, it says. At least in the initial deployment. Okay, I'm just wondering if I should give this value or the recent one which I gave. Are you happy now? No. Oh, okay, I missed one more thing. Okay, export. Yes. So it's asking you to evolve. So I'm thinking it's after the name of the something. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Let's see. Hopefully this works. Let's see. It's always fun when all your environment variables is just, nope, I don't know you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, great job Hopefully on that. this get um, deployed. And when it is really deploying, we should see that uh, the health check is going down. Right, it says, Google get pods. As you can see, I can, it says container creating. Hopefully it creates the right one. And now if I go ahead, see, as you can see, uh, this when this instance of the health check ran, it says it's unhealthy because the pod is still starting up, right? And this another call out, because it's a demo, we're just having only one instance of the pod, basically only one replica is running in your production environments also, you will, ne you will never run with one instance, right? Because when during this particular uh, deployments or rollouts, you can see that it, the, the momentarily your application could be down, right? So you'll always run minimum of two pods. And when that happens, you also have multiple rollout strategies in Kubernetes that will ensure and zero downtime uh, you know, deployments. Yeah. Right. All right, so, so uh, now let's go ahead can... and uh, refresh the page, yeah? Uh-huh. Let's have a look at the UI. Yeah. So, okay. Let's do it one more time. Okay. And when I go to the cart and they say checkout, it's still enabled, right? Have a discount code and it's asking us to show that, right? That's because we've not really turned off the feature, right? We've just enabled the feature flag implementation in the application, right? Now, for us to see whether the feature flag is really um, uh, implemented or not, right? we said we can we have exposed an endpoint, right? So what we're going to do now is slash features and then say feature name equal to, I think it's called coupons, right? Yeah. Oops. Slash features and feature name. So I think I've done some mistake in that case then. It should show the feature flag, whatever we have created, right? Mm. So kind of curious though, you said that we're about to disable it. So does that mean I need to go into uh, the mm -hmm. config? I need to rebuild yes. everything and redo everything, everything? Or, you know, how Not much exactly. do to change? Yeah, right. So because we've already implemented the feature flags in the particular application, right? There, there's no need of any further application changes, right? What we would end up doing is we'll go to this config map, right? Where we'll go ahead and go to config map YAML. And then we'll say here, it says feature coupon man, coupons is true, right? We'll just toggle it to false, right? This is one of the changes. That's when externalizing the configuration is going to help us, right? And once we do this change, all we need to do is just again, redeploy the same container, just uh, redeploy the application with charts. So that what this will do is it will pick up the latest image and then it is trying to deploy the same image into the into the AKS. Right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing here is that we are building the case for using the cloud service, right? Because mm -hmm. every time I need to go into that config file, switch it between false and true, or I do so from yeah. the UI, it is a bit cumbersome, right? Yeah. And yeah. we probably want to centralize this a bit more than to go into a Helm file and just set, you know, from true to mm -hmm. false or false to true. 
Okay, I think sorry, I got an issue. Uh, it is trying to put this from this Helm chart registry, right? But I think when we deployed the newer version, where I gave the different registry name, right? right. That's where we don't see the uh, see the endpoints. So we, let me quickly you know set that, uh, right? Uh, so that we can already see this working. Mm -hmm. Just give me a second. Um, so eShop registry equal to what might be should I just simply say first code dollar shop registry is eShop dev uh, okay that's the thing echo eShop underscore registry port and the registry name was this one right this was the registry name I gave Just looking at my commands once again to see I don't mess up things. So before the start of it, what was the name I gave? Xe shop registries. Okay, I think I gave the registry name as this entire registry name. Okay, good that I saw this now. So I'll give this registry name. Okay, and now let me do a deploy. So we were pushing the image to the wrong registry, right? Yeah, yeah. We pushed it to this registry, but then we were trying to deploy the deploy the older image from the other registry name, right? The eShop dev, which was the initially set up one, right? Right. So now, so, uh, hopefully, remember, yeah, uh, if you're following along with this, you can definitely complete the exercises in, in your own time. Um, mm -hmm. so, so don't worry yeah. about this. Um, yeah. And again, yeah, the health check is down because the containers are still creating. And if you still further run, kubectl get pods you should see that uh, okay it is image will back off that's not good okay so that means there's something problem uh, with that image i think and instead of this i should uh, better do that okay yeah so how much time do we have okay 20 minutes are there any questions that we can take or I could otherwise uh, put another quick fix? Uh, I might need to rebuild the image pointing to this registry itself and then we could, uh, we should be good. Yeah. Uh, so basically yeah, I need to set this one, uh, export eShop registry equal to this and then I would need to run this entire Docker command again so that it's going to build and then push into that particular registry and then from there all the other scripts should work properly. Yeah. There is your name. Excuse me. Let me quickly do that. And then what was that command here? not deploy i want to do a build right i will now do a build hopefully this time it should be faster let's see spa shot level spa linux latest yeah okay yeah because it's a uh, docker right it's kind of it, it's trying to take various commands that it's doing it's caching those it doesn't yeah. need to repeat everything yeah right ideally it should be let's see okay Yeah, maybe as this builds, right, maybe I can quickly talk about the Azure App configuration side of the things, what we would do it, and then maybe we can come back to the demo and then look at the demo. Yeah? Right. So the, the idea is, I think you might have got the point now, right? So initially, when uh, when we started, the code base doesn't have a feature management implementation at all, right? And then we added a bunch of packages, which is ASP.NET Core, a feature Microsoft a feature management, and feature management ASP.NET Core. And feature management is what is introducing these feature flag, uh, uh, con, uh, con feature flag implementation inside our core. Plus, uh, the ASP.NET Core is going to enable the tag helpers. That's what we made it. And now, what we're trying to do is uh, and build this entire application with the feature management implementation in it, and then push it and deploy it into AKS, right? After this, we will only then we'll now until now we have just only enabled the feature toggling aspects. And to toggle, like I showed, what we would do for later is we will simply go ahead and keep on changing true and false, and then it should uh, continue to behave as expected, right? 
that is the crux so far right now as we can see we have to every time redeploy at least the config map itself right now how do we avoid that right that is when we would go ahead and use something called the uh, azure app configuration right so let me quickly jump back to the slides for a few seconds as that happens right right maybe we can do a knowledge check while this is working right yeah yeah absolutely all so right let so me, back let to me my, bring my that. screen here I think I can do that. So let me open that here. Okay. So let's take a second question here. Uh, the second question is the feature management library's tag helper serves what purpose in ASP.NET core race views? Can you take us through the options for me? Okay, I think we just saw that. So feature tag is irrelevant to ASP.NET core racer views. It's used in Angular view to render content based on feature state. Um, uh, not really, I think, because it's very much we saw in the code that feature flag was used, right? And then feature tag conditionally renders content based on feature state in ASP.NET Core Razor views. That seems an interesting option. And or the feature flag tag defines a new feature flag in the Razor markup to be used in Azure App configuration. So are we trying to define a new flag with the feature tag? Um, not exactly. Let's see. Other options are the feature tag defines a new feature flag in the project file. To be used in the Azure App configuration, hmm. it's a bit tricky question. Yeah, uh, but my take would be it's mostly around the feature tag conditionally renders the content based on feature state. I think number B would, would be the option which I would go with because I remember the code what I made. We had a negative equal true, we had a specific sec section, and then if it is not enabled, we also had under specific section. So I, my take would be to uh, on B, the option B. All right, so yeah, and don't forget to vote on aka.ms slash polls. Uh, let's give it a few more seconds. Mm -hmm. All right. The answer is exactly what you said, Swami, right? We conditionally <laughs> render content based on a feature state that we grab from yeah. somewhere. We have the feature tag in our markup, in our race view, and you know, depending on what the value of the feature flag is, it's either going to render it or don't render it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. All right. Uh, we do have an exercise coming up after that. Okay. What's the current state of your exercise? Yeah, I think yeah, the Docker build is still going on. I think it should be done in a, in a minute or so, and then we can quickly show this and then move on to the Azure App configuration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's copying the files now, right? The source code files. Yeah. Great. So you can see the step here below in the terminal. You can see it's almost there. So 21 yeah, steps out of 25. That is good. It yeah. produced a DLL file and yeah, some Docker cleanup. And now it's starting to push. Yeah. Or it's done pushing. It says it's pushing. Let's see. Hopefully this should work. If not, I think we got the idea on what needs to be done and how how what is the exact flow. Right? We can always go into the learn module and then follow through the steps uh, in sequence and that should work. Yeah, so awesome. I'll try doing a deployment once again. I'm, I'm running the deploy application.sh command, right? And this should push this image into the AKS. And hopefully, I shouldn't be seeing any back off related errors. Uh, so I think uh, it's unhealthy for the last seven minutes. That's also a real time scenario, right? Where if you're trying to push a wrong image or if you're trying to deploy a wrong image, your application could go completely down, which is what we are seeing here. Okay, let's see if it is able to. It'll get pods. So we have an excellent question here from our audience from oh, YouTube. Okay. They are asking the following: Should the feature flag usage be developer choice or product owner business driven? You have any opinions, Swami? Excellent. So the implementation should be developer's choice, but yeah, whether we want to turn on the feature or not is something definitely business driven, right? Uh, from from the development perspective, we just need to enable such capabilities in the application. Uh, but then, yeah, who is going to toggle the feature? I think that control I will leave it to my business owners because they know they understand the business better, right? Right. So maybe I can just quickly introduce the next exercise, what we're about to do, so we we understand that part. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what we are about to do is to implement the Azure App Configuration Service to make sure that we have that uh, cloud provision service that we use instead and we move all our config into that service. Uh, as part of that, we will need to provision an app configuration uh, instance. Uh, we'll need to understand the various Azure App uh, configuration features in the portal. Uh, we need to store various things such as the connection string. We need to add the feature flag in there. That's a separate chapter inside mm -hmm. of the service. And then 
we now need to start connecting our apps. So it's reading from the store. And as we've seen, every time we do a change, we redeploy to AKS, to Azure Kubernetes Services. And then lastly, we can test out the feature flag. Yeah. Uh, before we go into knowledge check, we will show the last exercise so you can see what the various steps are. Uh, hopefully, we have time to go through this. If we don't, let's just view them, right? Yeah. We see here in, uh, as part of the exercise, hopefully I can enhance that a little bit so it's large enough. One of the first things you are doing is to provision an uh, app configuration instance. Now you can either do this through the portal, start typing Azure config service mm -hmm. and it will show up, or you can do so via the command line using, for example, Azure CLI, or, or you know, if you can also use PowerShell to create these uh, resources. Yeah. Now, once you've created that uh, cloud resource, it's up and running, it's under that same resource group as everything else, you need to start moving your configuration values, right? So the feature flag value, the uh, various, um, uh, endpoints, uh, connection mm -hmm. strings, what have you, that you're going to read from, right? That's very specific to your app. So move those in there and just an emphasis on you don't store secrets in here. I think we mentioned that as <laughs> part of the talk already, yeah. but you can leave in a reference for a key vault in there. So, you know, the actual super secret stuff could be stored inside of key vault. Yeah. Now, uh, just to go through the portal, what you're doing is to add the feature flag itself. So here we are inside the portal. Uh, we go into our app configuration store. We click it open and we uh, go inside of a menu option where we say, hey, I want to add this feature flag. I give it a name. I think it's coupons and I hit apply, right? So this is a very straightforward UI exercise of adding the feature flag, adding the value. Mm -hmm. And uh, as part of uh, connecting all of this, we need to ensure that we have the NuGet package from before we have already installed that, uh, I believe, right in the web spa. And yeah. uh, we can see some code. Maybe you can take us through this part of the C sharp code. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, oh, oh, sure. Yeah, okay. I'm actually in the portal again, just, just trying to add the coupons, how we can do it, right? So we can, if, if my screen can be flashed here. Right. So we can switch the screens to Swami so we can show the portal. Yeah. So I'm here in the uh, Azure app configuration, what was provisioned with the script. So I also ran the script here, right, to create the particular Azure app configuration and Azure app configuration service. And then that's up and running already, right? So here, when you go here, you can go and look at the app configuration. And you can see on the left hand side, we have a feature called feature management here, right? And click on our add button here and you will see the feature flag name in our case it's coupons and here's the toggle what i was talking about it you just uh, click or uncheck it then it should be good and here's where you can define the labels and here's where you can design a feature filter if you want for this demo we're going to keep it simple so no feature filters and say apply uh, that means the feature flag creation is done all right it's as simple as that so now we can go down to our uh, go back to our code sorry and then we can start making the code changes so one, one important thing is, yeah, we need, our code should understand which uh, Azure App Configuration service to connect to, right? That is where you would use this particular uh, value. Again, so saying it, because it's demo, we've just put in the endpoint here. Otherwise, you would put it into a key vault and then you'll reference from the key vault there, right? This is step one. And then the step two is you would need to also go and make some more code changes. Uh, so which uh, before making the code changes, we need to add the uh, NuGet package, right? So here, I'm going to say, uh, this one. I'm adding this Microsoft Azure App Configuration ASP.NET Core. So what this is going to do is, like we, if you recollect, we talked about different app configuration uh, providers, right? This is one of the configuration provider for ASP.NET Core, and that that is going to take the precedence over all the other providers, whatever we have deployed, uh, we have added into the code, right? Right. So after adding this, we also need to make some more code changes to uh, to use this particular provider. Let me go ahead and do that in the interest of time. Uh, so I'll go to web SPA and then I'm going to program.cs file. Web, web SPA program.cs. And here is where we are going to have the app configuration code here, right? So, oops. so we need to call actions.connect, right? And then we need to read the app configuration endpoint, I believe. Yeah, right. So here, as you can see in the config builder, right? 
uh, uh-huh. we are ask we are adding the config we are configuring the app configuration here uh, right and then we are telling uh, this settings is going to come from our app settings json whatever we have put in the environment variable right so basically we are using this particular use feature management environment variable to decide whether we want to go with the azure app configuration or not that's a check what is done here right and config builder dot build is the default configuration builder will give you all the you know all the environment variables available here that's how we are able to get that in the settings and if it's if it's uh, available then if we also have the app configuration endpoint set up then we are going to configure that as ever uh, as your app configuration right as we can see here the caching time is set to 5 seconds so that means what this could do is whenever the, this particular application comes up it will read this particular endpoint uh, endpoint configuration and establish a connection to that endpoint and then it will also try to uh, get the feature flags from there right so here what we are telling is we are telling its cache expression interval is this much time right that means for 5 seconds the particular uh, uh, feature management colon coupons this particular uh, uh, feature flag would be cached right and that's where we are configuring the refresh as well the refresh options we are telling we are registering for this key so that means whenever this key changes right it will keep on refreshing the in the the feature flags so for example if you have multiple feature flags set up that right, in that case you can have something called a sentinel key that means on on whenever that key is changed that's like an indication for for your application to react right whenever that key changes then you can refresh all of your uh, keys otherwise what you would end up doing is you might need to register for different different key changes right? for example in the, in this demo case it's only one which is a coupons right what if you want to have five different feature toggles you don't want to register all the five here right what you would use is a concept called sentinel key you create a sentinel key in azure app configuration and you register your refresh for that particular key here okay right and so also interesting to notice the cache time right it will tell you for how long yeah. it's going to hold on to the value before it's throwing it out and it's going to read a new one right yeah yeah absolutely uh yeah so one more place we need to go into program cs and there's a couple of additions we need to do there yeah right i think it's a startup cs right startup the startup CS, we need to yes. go and configure this as well so we did yeah so here is where we are going to say that we are going to use azure app configuration All right and i think that's about it oh yeah we need also need to add the service into the services collection so that's the last part uh, which mm-hmm. is in uh, configure services yeah, so it's kind of good to have a mental headspace of always talking to config uh, method, but also configure services, right? So every time you try to yeah. add a capability and use it, yeah. two places. Yeah. So those are the code changes. After this, again, the same process. We need to create a new image for this particular uh, version of the code, whatever we modified now, push it into ACR, and then deploy it into AKS. After that, what you should ideally see is you don't need to do any other uh, redeployments, right? When you go and... Uh, for now, as you can see, this is an enabled here, right? If you just uncheck it, it automatically says the feature is updated, right? It's, it's just as simple as that. So you can toggle on and off here, and then immediately within five seconds, this particular feature flag should be reflected in the application, right? Right. Which is what I was intending to show, and due to some of my terminal issues, I think I'm not able to show that. But I think the idea is clear, right? We always have this learn module, and then we can go ahead and uh, look into that. Yeah. Okay. So let's try to wrap this up uh, back in yeah. my screen. Uh, we have managed to do all the things that we set out to do, right? We have uh, made sure that we are using the cloud service to read our configuration, which will make it a lot easier than if we were to store that just in configuration files. So there's no more dealing with images back and forth, right? We can just control this you know, from one point from the Azure portal. So yeah, we showed you ASP.NET Core configuration, Kubernetes configuration, and how to implement the feature management library. Uh, in many places, right? Both in the Angular app as well as the race review. Uh, and also that we implement the centralized Azure app configuration store. Now, my recommendation is that you now go into that module, review it in your own time. We are here to guide you today, but we definitely encourage you for the best learning experience, do these exercises yourself, do them in one go so we don't have our issue with environment variables that are just disappearing on us. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. So here's, uh, you can either scan the QR code or you can just type in the link and it will take you to the model uh, module. Feature flags, ASP.NET Core microservices. That was the topic of the day. And yes, there's mm-hmm. a whole long series. There are more parts in this series. I believe more is coming up next week. Um, see do we have yeah we got one one more minute i'm not sure we have any time to take any questions 
but hopefully all of you feel today that hey i learned something i could use feature flags i can yeah. use that within the context of microservices yeah I just wanted to say thank you so much, everyone who viewed us so far. So thank you from Chris here in the UK and from Swami in India, right? Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for listening in. Hopefully, yeah, if you have any questions, please, with our handles are available, please feel free to reach out to us. Then we should be more than happy to help you out. Thank you.